Across the border. My name is Chad Skidem. I'm like Forrest Gump. You can call me Chad Skidem. <laughs> I have no other name. Chad Skidem, which tale? And like my wife was saying, in the 40s, I was born at the foot of Mount Baker. In 1949, we burned out and we moved to the Olympic Peninsula. But prior to moving to the Olympic Peninsula, we, we had to be eight years old to go to school and we didn't know there was anybody else on the planet except for our family. All my aunts and uncles all lived right around us, and their children and us were all the same age. So there were six kids in my family, and there were six and five and six in all my aunts and uncles' family. So we thought we were the we thought we were the only people on earth. We didn't know there was anybody else. Then when we got old enough to go to school, we found out there were other people, and it was a very cruel world. We had no idea. Because when we grew up as children, our grandmother is one who was our teacher. And we were never hit. We had no idea what it felt like to be slapped about anything. That, that was something that didn't happen in our family. I, I imagine we were naughty, but we just weren't hit. So when we got in school, we got hit a lot, and we didn't know how come. We get hit for speaking our language. We got hit for being left-handed. We got hit because we were siwash. We had no an idea what all this stuff was. So when we come home from school, I told my grandmother, what, you know, why my hand was all swapped. That's because I was left-handed. She said, what is it? And I said, I don't know. But I got it someplace in school. I didn't have it before I went to school. Because I, <laughs> I got smacked because I got a sidewash on me. She said, where is it? And I said, I don't know where that's at either. That's but they don't like it, whatever it is. And I said, I got smacked because I had to go to the bathroom. And I stood up and tried to go out. And she said, where do you think you're going? I said, the bathroom, you should raise your hand. I said, I don't have to raise my hand, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the teacher got, thought I was being smart there, she spiked me to the road. So I'd ask my sisters and stuff in class, in Indian, what am I doing wrong? And she'd beat us up for speaking Indian. So it was a very cruel place the first day in school. <clears throat> but we learned. We learned our place, we learned how we're supposed to be. When my father come home, I asked him outright, what is a siwash, Dad? He says, siwash is like calling a white person a white trash. So what's a white trash? He says, like calling a colored person a, a, a nigger, nigger. I says, what is that? He didn't know how to explain to me what prejudice was. We had no idea. We didn't know what it was. It was beyond our comprehension. And they said, how do you like school? I said, well, it, it sure is a rough place to be. And our teacher stutters really bad. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, our teachers get up in front of us and she tells us, look at, look at Jane, jump, jump, jump. See spot, leap, 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 leap. <laughs> <laughs> we, thought she, she, we thought that she stuttered badly. <laughs> because she kept repeating herself over and over and over. <laughs> and she told us about Little Red Riding Hood and Humpty Dumpty, which had absolutely no, there was no way I could live off from it. There was no moral to the story as to how I can make things from it. Everything in Indian country, when we sit around like this as children and our adults stood in front of us and talked to us, when they were done, we knew how to make all this. We knew how to make it because it was part of the, the teaching to tell stories is how things were done. I'd like to give you an example. One of my most favorite stories is Quackwiash. Quackwiash was a very rotten, I mean really horrible little girl. And nobody in the village really liked her. She was just too naughty. And every time they'd go to the houses, they'd go to somebody's house, and they'd go and they'd knock on the door. And they'd say, shh, it's Quackwash, don't let her in. She, she'll bust everything in the house. And the parents would go to the next house, and they'd, and they'd say, shh, it's Quackwash. Don't let her in, because she's such a rotten little girl. We don't want her in here. They kept going from door to door and all around the village. And nobody in the village wanted to let her in. They felt really bad that nobody liked them no more because the little girl was so rotten. So they went to Grandma and Grandpa's house. They got there and they said, Grandpa, can you do something for Quackwash? No, but it's your granddaughter. He said, I told you, teach them when they're little. 
Don't let them get all rotten and spoiled, then bring them to me and want me to fix them. <laughs> said, well, it's your granddaughter. Would you please take care of her and fix her up? <laughs> well, he said, we'll try. He said, but you have to leave her with Grandma and Grandpa. Quack, quack. said, no, no, I'll be good. Don't, don't leave me with Grandma. So, I'll be good, Mom. I'll do everything you tell me to do. Please don't leave me. Nope, you're going to stay here. So Grandma and Grandpa grabbed her and Quack, quack was putting up a big fight. Grandpa said, Throw her down in the canoe. So Grandma grabbed her and she threw her down in the canoe. He said, sit on her. So Grandma sat on top of Quack Quash and Grandpa got his pole and he started pulling his canoe up the river. <clears throat> he went up as far as he could go. He got all the way up there by the foot of Comacual Shan, Mount Baker. He got out of his canoe and he took Quack Quash out and he put rocks in a circle like we're sitting here. He got them all around and he put Quack Quash right in the middle and he said, you're not to move. You stay right here in this circle. Five days from now, I'll come back. She said, five days? Five days. No, I'll, please take me home, Grandpa. I promise I'll be good. I'll never do nothing wrong again. Nope, because you're going to stay here. So he took some roots and some water and he put it in the middle of the circle. And he said, you're to stay here and not leave the circle no matter what. So that, they pulled out and quack, quack, straight, crying. Ah. Ah, 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 ah. And all the deer and elk said, oh my God, what is that a horrible racket? <laughs> all the birds and everything flew away and elk and deer and bears scattered in every direction. Quack Quack was out there just a blubbering, making a heck of a racket. Pretty soon it started getting dark. Clumach started coming down, it started raining. Oh, Quack Quack was sitting there getting all wet. She said, whatever will I do? Sasquatches are hiding in the bushes, they're going to eat me up. Now it's raining on me, I'm going to get pneumonia. I don't know what I'm going to do. And you uh, ah, 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 ah. First he said, what's wrong with you, little girl? She said, who are you? Never mind, pay attention. She said, pay attention to what? Said, where are you at? He said, just pay attention. You start breaking daylight and she looked where the voice was coming from. There was a great big cedar tree. And the cedar tree said, just pay attention. And she said, I'll teach you to talk to me, you ugly old tree. And she walked over to the tree and she grabbed the bark and she started pulling it off. The bark went way up the tree about 30 feet. She drug it back over to her circle. And she sat down and she started separating the outside bark from the inside bark. As she was doing that, she got the bark separated. And when she got through, she took the bark that she was separating and she started weaving it. I'll teach you to talk to me. I'll tangle up your tongue. So she started weaving it and she made a mat like this one that's in front of me here. She got it about five feet, five feet by four feet. So when she finished, she took it up and she wrapped it around her. She said, oh man, this feels good. I'll call this, I'll call this a yashik. No, this will be really good. And I'll make it a blanket and it'll keep me nice and dry. So she took her really nice blanket and she was sitting there all wrapped up in it, feeling pretty smug about herself, what she made. Besides that, she fixed that tree so it couldn't talk no more. It started getting dark again and she was sitting there and shwaw, it started shooting and thunder and lightning. President Slamuk started coming down again. Ah, uh, wah, 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 and said, now what's wrong with you? Now what's wrong with you? What do you mean what's wrong with me? She said, it's cold. I'm all wet again. Well, you got a blanket. Yeah, but my head's getting wet. I said, well, pay attention. Pay attention. Broke daylight and she looked where the voice was coming from. When she pulled the bark off from the tree, a piece of the bark was still sticking out. Underneath that bark was nice and dry. She said, aha. So she pulled bark off the tree. She sat down and she took and she started weaving again. She was weaving it. She got it, got a little square going. When she got it squared out, she grabbed and she started pulling it. When she pulled it, it went up to a point. So she took it and she put it upon her head. And she said, oh boy, a Yashikwin. I'll call this a Yashikwin, a hat. The rain would come down the hat, run off onto the blanket, off the blanket on the ground. Now she wasn't getting wet no more. She said, this is good. This is good. Aichika, she said to that tree. Very thankful she got something by paying attention. So she was sitting there eating her roots and drinking her water. Pretty soon she looked around, she didn't have no more food. She said, oh my goodness, 
Now I'm lost up here, now I'll starve. Sasquatches are after me. Nobody likes me. Grandma and Grandpa dumped me up here like a piece of cuck up here in the mountain. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm starving to death. I've been gone for months and months. I know it's been probably a year by now. And she's sitting there, ah, 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 and she's, oh, now what? She said, what do you mean, now what? I'm starving, you stupid. Where are you at? I said, pay attention. So it broke daylight, and she looked across over in the bushes, and here were these great big blueberries hanging there. Boys, oh boy, she left her circle like she wasn't supposed to. And she started eating the berries. And she went along through the woods and she said, oh, huckleberries. The way she went down the trail picking huckleberries. She said, oh boy, blackberries. The way she went, she was eating blackberries. She was having a good time eating and filling up her arms. And then pretty soon she started looking around and said, where's my circle? I've lost my circle. She started looking around the woods. The more she looked, the further away she got. She was really lost. She's packing all of her berries in her arms. She didn't know where to go to and she didn't know what to do. And it started getting dark again. Uh, 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 and he said, now nah, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, I'm lost. I can't find my circle. My berries are getting heavy. And I'm getting squished all over my pretty new blanket. I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, pay attention, little girl. He said, pay attention to what? Broke daylight and she looked and where the voice was coming from was this little bird. This little bird was weaving a nest. So quickly I sat there and she watched the little bird. She went over and she got some bark off the tree. She started weaving and she started making herself a nest. So she was sitting there and she's weaving and weaving. When she got through, she was looking at it and she said, boy, this is a nice little nest. And she put all of her berries in it. She was walking down the trail and she picked roots, picking everything, putting it in her little new basket. So this is real good mahoy. Oh, this night. So away she went with her little basket, gathering her food. It started getting dark again. Her arms were getting hard, and that basket was so heavy. She sat down at night and she started crying again. Ah, ah, ooh, ah. And he said, "Now what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Look at my arms. I look like a Sasquatch." My arms are getting long from packing this heavy basket. And he said, well, pay attention. She said, pay attention to what? When it broke daylight, she looked down on the ground. Where the voice was coming from was this little tiny ant, Tatutlum. Little Tatutlum was going along and he had a great big spider on his back. Quack, quack, I sat there and she walked that, watched that little ant. Pretty here come another ant going by and he had a great big beetle on his back. I said, oh my goodness, those little buggers are really tough. <laughs> so she went over to the tree and she pulled off some more bark and she pounded it. She smashed it all up real nice and soft and she tied it to her basket. She said, well, if the ants can do it, so can I. So she put it on her back, put it over her sunlet. Her eyebrows are called sunlets. So the strap is called a sungleton. So she made a sungleton for her basket. Now she can take and put all her food on her back like the ant and both her arms are free and she can pack a big load. So she went along just happy with her new basket with a sungleton on it, picking stuff and going along. Pretty soon she could come through the swamp. You guys know what stringer nettles are? <laughs> well, she didn't. <laughs> so she walked right into the middle of all these stringer nettles. Oh, it just stung her legs horribly bad. She got a stick and said, you stupid, ugly, ugly, homely, retarded, ugly, and she knocked down all the stringy nettles. She was just furious. How dare you sting me? And they were still talking to her yet. So she said, I'll fix you. She got, got down and she pulled all the skin off. She took all the skin and the insides of the, the stuff and she put it on her leg and she started spinning it. And she'd add another piece and she'd spin it. And she kept doing this, and when she got through, she had this real nice bundle of stringer nettle twine. So this twine, she grabbed it and she pulled it really hard and she couldn't break it. She said, oh, this is good, but I don't know what I'm going to do with it. <laughs> so she stuck it in her basket the way she went. She was going through the woods with her new bundle of twine, and her basket and her sungleton, her hat and her blanket. Boy, she's feeling pretty smart about herself. Pretty soon she's coming along. Pretty soon it started getting dark again. Her stomach was quackwish and just growling. 
Ah, crazy. Oh, her stomach could grow. Crazy said it. <laughs> and this boy said, now what? Now what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? I'm starving. Sasquatches are going to pounce on me any moment. It's rained on me. It's snowed on me. I'm lost. Nobody cares. And I'm dying up here. And you say, what's wrong with me? Sheesh, I'm starving. Broke daylight and she looked where the voice was coming from. And it was a little spider. This little spider was making a cobweb. She said, why are you showing me this? He said, pay attention. She said, pay attention to what? She said, pay attention. So she started watching this little spider. He went round and round and round, and he made this really nice web. And she said, why are you showing me this? He said, pay attention. He backed off from his web, and here comes the fly. He got stuck in his web. He ran out and he grabbed it and he ate it. And she said, yuck, gross. Why would you show me how to eat who would want to eat a rotten bug? This is sick. You're really a sick spider. How dare you show me such a gross thing? The spider said, pay attention. So she sat there and she watched. Here come a moth. And it got stuck. The spider ran out there and he grabbed it and he ate it. She said, oh, yeah. Ah, oh, you're horrible. So I'll never do something like that. So she sat down and stuck her stinging little twine that's being passed around here. And she started copying the spider and she made a web. She kept making it bigger and bigger and bigger. Pretty soon she had it about eight feet in circumference. So oh, I don't eat no bugs, and she put it in her basket. And away she went. She was going along in the woods, and pretty soon she could hear the stallow, the river. <gasps> I hear the river. If I can find that river, I can find my way home. All I have to do is follow it downstream. She got over by the river, and she looked down in the river, and here was this big channel swimming up the river. Uh, oh. If I could only catch that salmon. If I could, oh, I'm so hungry. If I could just catch it. And the salmon swam on by. Pretty soon she looked downstream and here come another one. She thought about that spider and she took her web out and she throwed it in front of him. The salmon come along, got tangled up in the web and she pulled it in and she got some sticks and she put it down and she made a fire and she cooked this wonderful salmon. And she looked at this web for a long time. So I'm going to call this a net. When I get home, I'll give it to my father. So she put it in her basket. She was nice and full. And away she went with her full tummy and half of her fish yet. She was coming down the river, and when she got down around the corner, she recognized the scenery. So, oh, I know where I'm at. I'm almost home. Pretty soon she come around the corner, she could see her village. When she got there, she was looking down. She said, oh, she was so happy. I've been gone for so many years and years. I know it must be years. I hope my people are even alive yet. She was going along and the young kids were down and looked up the river and said, oh, there's a monster coming. There's a monster coming down the river. It's got a pointed head and a great big hunchback and it's got stuff sticking out all over it. Get your bows and your spears. All the men got their bows and arrows and they come out and they were just going to shoot. And Quackwayash's mom said, wait, don't shoot, don't shoot, it's Quackwayash. Nah, it can't be. She's been gone for a long time. She's perished. Nope, that's her. So they waited, and sure enough, here come Quackwayash walking down the river. She came down, and the people were glad to see her for the first time in her life. They didn't, they didn't lock their doors on her. She reached over, and she took off her Yashiquin, and she gave it to her grandpa. She said, Grandpa, this is yours. I learned it by paying attention in the mountain. If you put this on, rain will run off from your head, and you won't, you won't get wet. When the sun is shining, if you have it on, the skin won't fall off your nose no more. <laughs> Grandpa said, oh, thank you, Clanny. So he took the wonderful hat that he made, she made. She took down, put her basket down, and she took off her, her, uh, her blanket. She said, Grandma, this is for you. If you wear this at nighttime, your old bones won't be sore in the morning when you wake up. Oh, thank you, Clanny. And she took her web out of her out of her bas basket, and she said, Father, this is for you. I call it a fishing net. She said, I learned how to make it from the stinger nettles, and I learned how to make the net from the spider by paying attention. So I just wove this really nice and tight. Now you don't have to stand on a rock and stay out there with your spear for hours and hours. Now all you have to do is take and put this web in the river, and the fish will come along and they get tangled up in it, and you can have fish anytime you want. 
Ah, oh, thank you, Lanny. And she said, from the little beaver. So I learned how to make this. So I call this a drill. So now when you have your shells, so all you have to do is take your shell, take the little beaver tooth, put the knot hole limb on there, and where you go and you can drill a hole. She says, I learned how to make this from the little beaver by watching him and he burrowing through. So she took the drill and she gave it to her uncle. She said, this is for you because you're always carving stuff all the time. So he was very, very happy with what she brought him. She said, Grandma, so this I learned how to make when I was by the swamp. You know what cattails are? Mm -hmm. She said, well, you take the cattails, and you take and you lay them down on the ground, and you let them dry, and they turn out white like this mat that's down here. And they're all kind of shaped like a U. So you take this ironwood needle, and you shape it like a V. And you put a sharp point on the end of it, and you tie a piece of deer sinew on the end. And you take and you shove it through the cattails. And when it gets through the cattails, you tie another cattail on the end, it'll cut through. And you pull it on, put it in there like that. You take your creaser, like an iron, and you put it over it and you crease it back and forth. And it shapes those, shape the cattails up in a mat, so it'll accept the next one going through. And you turn around and you bring it back, and back and forth. And when you're through, you have a mat like this. So the grandmother is very pleased to receive this new thing that she brought back from the mountain. She took all these different gifts that she learned how to make. So I was watching this little hummingbird. A little hummingbird was flying along. She now watched him as he was weaving things with his little shark beak. So I took it and I used it when I was making baskets. So I just take and stick his little beak in there. And I stick, put my put my bark through and pull it. Stick his little beak and pull it through. So I learned how to make this, and I found this deer horn that the, beef, that the little mice have been chewing on. They made it sharp for me, so I just stuck it in this little place where there was a little limb fell out. So I used it for putting it in there. And it takes all the bark I can use, so I call it an awl. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so she gave it to her auntie, and her auntie was very happy to have this new basket weaver. And she says, when I was walking through the woods, as I was walking along, the cedar trees would reach out and they'd touch me. And as I was touched by the cedar tree, I said I could feel a different difference in my body. So I took the cedar limbs and I brushed myself with it. And I could feel it taking off things and taking off sorrow, taking off bad things that I was carrying on me, taking away bad dreams and all the things I had. She said, so, I brought this home for all of our people to use. So the cedar boughs from the Palakton, the cedar tree. So the cedar tree is used for a human brush. It's also used for brushing your house to keep it nice and clean. She said, if you let cobwebs get stuck in your house up in the corners, any place, like this one right above me, <laughs> if there's cobwebs in your house and there's bad feelings, say your wife and you got in a big fight, those feelings are going to get stuck in that web, and they'll stay there. Next time you get mad at one another, you'll bring up the same thing that you were fighting out before. But if you take cedar boughs and brush your house and keep it clean, and then, <laughs> then it won't, then it won't uh, do that no more. So they took, the, they took all the stuff that she brought home, and she showed them, she said, outside the bark, if you take it off the tree, we'll make the little basket. The little baskets are used for, for berries. They're used for bailing out a canoe. They're used for carrying water. You can use them, it takes about five minutes to make one. You just walk up to a tree and chop with a little hatchet, fold up the ends and put a limb on it and you got a basket. So she showed them all the different gifts she learned by being patient and listening, paying attention. The inside of the bark is what we make our baskets and our clothing and stuff out of. The big basket is made from spruce bark. And from the roots of the spruce come the, come the material for making the big basket. When they handed me this basket, they said this is 150 years old. And they gave it to me. Now this basket is over 200 years old. 
I've had it that long. So every so often, I let my basket have a drink. It needs to be watered every so often. If you guys have baskets in your possession, water them once in a while. Any kind, I don't know who made them. Anything that's into a basket form, give it a drink about every six months. Put it in a shower and let it get good thirst and fill it up. So this is a spruce root basket made from the roots of a spruce. And it's very, very old and they're very strong. They use them for carrying wood and everything. So Grandma said that anybody in your family or your community, no matter how rotten they are, don't outcast them because they're the ones who might bring back all the things that you're going to need in the future as what we have in front of us here. And Quackwayash is one of the most favorite stories that I have that it, it tells me so much. We were sitting in an audience, we were some people sitting in the audience at another place I was talking and I seen a man who had lost his hair. And I got to think about it. You never see a bald-headed Indian. There, there's no such thing. Maybe in the future there will be, but up to my age, there's no such thing as a bald-headed Indian. And I got to thinking about what our great-grandfather said. He went up in the mountain up by Comacol Shan, up by Mount Baker, and he was fasting. While he was there fasting, he had his scarf down over his eyes, and he was sitting in the snow, praying. He could hear something walking toward him in the snow. He lifted up his scarf, and here was this man with his face upside down. He said, oh my goodness, he couldn't believe it. So he talked to this man, and this man had talked back, but he couldn't understand him. The guy's tongue made lots of noise, but he couldn't understand the language. So the man started talking in his funny sign language, and he didn't understand that either. The man looked up, and his eyes were blue like the sky. When he was looking up, the hair on his face underneath lifted up, and he could see this black and white color. He thought this man is trying to dress like a loon for some reason. So he looked at this man with his face upside down. Because he didn't have no hair up here, and he had lots of hair in his face, he thought his face was upside down. <laughs> so he went home, and all the young people come running to him. Grandfather, what did you see in the mountain? Achina. He said, I seen a man up there with his face upside down. <laughs> ah, Grandpa, and it's true. He said, he didn't have no hair up here. He said, but he had lots right here. And his eyes were blue like the sky. Grandfather, he said, it's true. It's true. And he tried to look like a loon. He said, what do you mean a loon? <laughs> he had a little white and black collar around his neck, dressed like a loon. What did he say, Grandpa? And he said, I don't know. I couldn't understand him. But he talked sign language to me. What did he say? He said, he'd go like this. He said, I don't know what he was saying. But he would look up toward the calls. So whatever he was saying, I figured it must be good because he's talking to the same people that we talk to. Ah, he said he's coming to our land and he's coming soon. And he's really sick. What kind of sickness he got, Grandpa? He said, I don't know, but he's real pale. Not like us. <laughs> Very ill. But he's coming to our land. So Grandpa went home about three or four months later. Here come all the young people running up the house. Grandfather, what? He said, that man with his face upside down is in the middle of our village. So what's he doing? He said, he's kneeling down on Mother Earth, and he's, he's talking with his strange sign language, and he's looking up at Hulls. He said, what did you do for him? He said, we fed him. Ah, good. Feed him really lots. Maybe he'll get well and he'll go home. <laughs> so the young people start feeding this man. They fed him and they fed him. Thirteen moons went by, and they still couldn't communicate. But lo and behold, he learned how to talk Indian. As soon as he learned how to talk Indian, he gathered up all the people and he brought them down by the riverbank. He took a stick and he made seven marks in the sand. He said, now repeat after me. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, when he went over and over and over. And all the Indians learned how to say that. He said, now what's this? He said, Thursday. And what is Thursday? This today. What's tomorrow? And they said, this one, Friday. He said, all right. On Friday, you can only eat fish. Ah, that's a good belief you got. We like fish. <laughs> what kind of fish? He said, any kind of fish. That's all you can have. Oh, good. This is a good belief you've got. So Friday rolled around. Everybody had fish all day long. The Indians were all walking around. Boy, this guy sure got a good belief. Fish three times a day. This is good. So they're all eating their fish, and they're all happy. Next day, he brought them all down and lined them up by the river. 
and he took the old man, my grandfather, weighed him out in the middle of the river until it was just deep. He grabbed him by the back of the hair and he put him in water. He's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. He from this day forward, your name is Matthew. No more Indian name. Savage, if you have an Indian name. Ah, you know, you can change my name just by sticking me in the water. He's, yep. He don't have to pile up the blankets and mountain goat skins or nothing. No ceremony. Just stick me in the water. He's, that's right. So he went through the village and he named every person in the village. John, Charlie, Sam, Shirley, Betty. Give them all Juanitum names. The people were all standing around just shocked. They couldn't believe that they could take their name off and put just a funny name on them, just, just like that. I stick them on the water. He said, now tomorrow's what? And they said, Sunday. Everybody back here again, Sunday. All the Indians come back down the river bar on Sunday. He took his stick and he made a mark on the ground. He said, I want you to build me a longhouse from right here to right over there. He said, I don't want it long, I want it short. The Indians looked at him and said, you want a short longhouse? <laughs> yes. They looked at grandfather and grandfather said, go ahead and build it for him. So grandfather and everybody got busy and they made this long, short longhouse. When they got through making it, he said, now I'll go up on the front of the roof and make me another little house like this. He said, you going to put your smokehouse on top of your house? He said, no, 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 no. Ah, you're going to dry your salmon up there, wind dried salmon. Nope. You're going to make jerky. No, just build me a house up there. Grandpa said, go ahead. So all the people got busy. And they made him a little funny house up on top of his house. <clears throat> While they were doing that, he went down in the river bar. He got two sticks and he nailed them up in front of his door. He said, this is the cross. My house is called a church. All you Indians say church. They're all saying church. He said, that's right. He's now, everybody come in. He's going to teach how to pray and how to sing to the Lord. So he brought him in. He threw holy water on him. Made him kneel down, taught him how to pray and taught him how to sing. Oh, Matthew, the grandfather, only came once. Months went by and Matthew didn't come back. One day the father said, where's grandpa? Young people looked up the hill and said, he's home. What's he doing? He said, he's cooking. He said, how can you tell that from here? He said, well, there's smoke coming from outside of his house, which means he's cooking. If it's coming from inside, he's cooking. He's cold and he's warming up his house. <clears throat> and he's cooking. That guy said, uh oh, this is Friday. He better be eating fish. I'm going to go see. Up the hill, the father went, and everybody in the village followed him. He got up there, and here sat Matthew next to the fire. And he had a great big deer roast cooking in him. He said, Matthew, Matthew, what do you think you're doing? Matthew said, what? He said, you're supposed to eat fish on Friday. He said, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. He said, I'm the elder of this village. I've been thinking about what you've been teaching my people. This morning I woke up and I just clock was in. Oh, my stomach was growling. He said, I reached up on the wall. I got my old trade rifle. He said, I took one shell and he said, I put it in my sacred tobacco. He said, I prayed for it for a long time and I put it in my rifle. He said, I took some tobacco. I throw it on Mother Earth. Throw it something to Father Sky. I said a big prayer and did a ceremony. And I went up the mountain. He said, I shot gray, big old brother buck high up in the mountain. He said, I've seen over a hundred winters. Can't pick him up and carry him no more. I put a stick through his nose and I started dragging him. He said, boy, he's heavy. He said, I stopped and got my tobacco and threw it down the earth. Throw some to Father Sky. Looked at the deer and I threw some on him too. Asking the deer to lighten up a little bit so I can get him home. <laughs> he said, five times I stopped and had a ceremony on that deer. He said, see that crick right there? Father said, yeah. He said, I took off my moccasins. He said, I sat there and put my old poor feet in that creek, bathed them really good. He said, I got to think about what you're teaching my people. He said, I looked at old brother Buck right in the eye. He said, I grabbed him by the horns and I stuck him in the creek. And I said, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. From this day forward, your name is Fish. <laughs> <laughs> Our old people had stories for everything. 
<laughs> Our people really did think when they first seen non-Indians come with no hair that their faces were upside down. <laughs> and they had a story for it. And when they came here carrying their cross, that is how we lost our names. Exactly. I mean, they changed our names away. So four years ago, I walked into court, five years ago, I walked into court and I petitioned our court. I said, if they can put a Juanitum name on me, I can take it off. So I took mine off and I threw it to the wind. I've always been Chattiskatum with Stalem, but now that's the only name I have. That's why I said I'm like Forrest Gump. I went to court and took the other one off, completely off and threw it away. I traveled internationally. And when I traveled, I don't like to introduce, introduce myself by a Juanitum name when I'm there as a Native American. So all over the world I'm known as Chattiskatum with Stalem. And when you, when you grow up in the forest, like I did, at age nine, I moved into the woods. And I lived there until I was 14 years old. And I learned by studying animals. If an animal is sick and his droppings are soft, I track him along prison and droppings are solid. I backtrack and see what he ate. How did he get rid of his diarrhea? Whatever he ate, I would eat if I got diarrhea. If bears can eat grubs and worms, I can eat grubs and worms because I eat the bear. So I learned how to eat the protein that the bear looks for in the rotten log. I learned how to eat all the different roots by watching animals eat what they ate. And with the knowledge I had from my grandmother of the different medicines and the knowledge of the animals, I became very knowledgeable on Indian botany, how to stay alive in the woods. I learned, like Quackwayash, how to use whatever was already there in nature to make the things I needed to exist. I'd get in my canoe and I'd paddle out in the ocean I put my paddle across the canoe and put my legs over and I'd go to sleep. And whichever way the canoe was pointing when I woke up, that's where I went. I just traveled around following the tide and the wind. And when I was out there floating around in the, out in the ocean in my canoe, I thought about the old ladies that lived there in La Push. There were four ladies on the Olympic Peninsula who were old and they were bent over. And the old people said that those old people were well over 100 years old. They were very old and very cantankerous. They had a big long stick and boy could be hit with that stick. <laughs> but I learned by walking with those old women that none of the boys in the village would bother me because I couldn't talk to them. I didn't understand their language. So they beat me up because they talked to me and I didn't know what they were saying. They talked to me and I'd look at them and I knew whatever it was they were saying was no good by their expression and the tone of their voice. So I thought, well, if I want to get from one side of the village to the other, <clears throat> I'll follow the four old ladies because none of those boys dare get close to them. So after a while, the old ladies got tired of beating on me and they just left me alone. I'd walk with them. And I had a canoe. I was the only boy in the village that had one besides adults. So when I see the old ladies getting ready to make baskets, I'd jump in my canoe and I'd go up and I'd bring back basket material. And I'd give it to them. So pretty soon they got where they accepted me and they not only made baskets, but they taught me how to make them. So anytime we see the old ladies when they go like this, they're going to teach. And boy, we'd always watch them. Everybody in the village would watch them. One day we were down by the beach and we looked and we seen one of the old ladies calling. She had a basket on her back. I thought, oh boy, teaching time. So we went over and she told us to go down by the creek and cut some trees that are about this big at the bottom, about this clip to they're about this big at top. So we cut them down and we laid them on the driftwood on the beach. We got, got some sticks and started pounding, pounding these trees. We pound them while she was singing. We were keeping time to her music. And she'd sing and we kept on pounding. While we were pounding the bark on these little trees that we cut down, she was gathering firewood. And she's setting up to make a fire. When we got through pounding these little trees, she grabbed it and pulled the tree outside of the bark and had a hollow, big long bark. And we were just amazed that the bark come off like that. She took her thumbnail and she slid it by pulling it through and she had these long strips of real pretty bark and she rolled it inside out and tied it. By the time she got through that, doing that, her fire was going pretty good. We took our sticks and she told us, put it in the fire, big in first. So we stuck it in the fire. While we were standing there, she was singing to us and talking to us about whale hunting. You young guys are the next whale hunters of the Kuliu tribe. So I'm gonna teach you today how to hunt. So we had our, had our big poles and we had them in the fire. 
And as soon as they'd catch fire real good, we'd put it in the sand and we'd spin it. And we'd put it back in the fire. And while we were holding it in the fire, she kept on singing and telling stories of the whale hunt. We'd keep it until it was burning real good and we'd put it in the sand and we'd spin it. We kept on doing that and it kept getting sharper and sharper and sharper and fire hardened. And when we got through with it, these sticks with these hard points on them were just like, like rock. They were very hard, tempered wood that was burnt real good. Then we took our sticks and we put them by the log and we went down and we got rocks about this big, black oily rocks that you find on the ocean beach. They look like they got oil on them. They're cooking rocks. So we took them, we put them around the fire. The old lady told us to take our poles and put it by the rock that we carried up. So we brought them over and we stood our pole by it. She said, lean the top toward the fire. So we held it. So on the count of three, everybody let go. All of the young men holding their spears. So we're standing holding like this. She said, one, two, three, and we let go. And they fell and made a teepee over the fire. She said, now you know how to let go of your, let your spears. And the heat coming up, fire hardened the handles. After they got fire hardened, she was sitting on a beach and she took the nose off my seal. She cut his nose off and she started turning him inside out and she was scraping. As she was scraping off the oil, she was putting it in those little baskets like what's floating around here. <coughs> she, each of us boys had a brailer basket full of seal oil. So we took the seal oil and it was ours, it belonged to us. She gave it to us. When she got through taking all the fat off the seal, she took a limb and she wove it inside of itself by taking it round and round and round and round inside of itself. And she had a nice hoop. She took the hoop and she put it on the seal on his side. She told us to go down the beach about a hundred yards. Went down the beach and we held our spears. And she told us run and jump. Run and jump. Every third step, jump. We'd run and we'd come by to take our spear and run as fast as we can and stab it into that seal inside that hoop. So we did it over and over and over and she kept moving the hoop on the seal. We stabbed him over and over and over and over and over running, taking turns. When we got through, that seal looked like hamburger. It all pounded to pulp. She then rolled him over and she took his intestines out. A seal intestine will stretch from here to that building over there. So when they take it out the inside, one boy will take and put it in his finger like this and squeeze. The other boy will take it and he'll run with it. He runs with it, all the stuff that's in the intestine comes out and lands on the beach. When you get through, you have a hollow tube of intestine. Then she reached down and she took the seal meat that we pounded all up with spears and she put it inside that intestine and she tied a knot. She put some more in there and she tied a knot. And she had these sausages about this long, seal intestine sausages. And she took that in there and we took them, walked over and put our poles up to a teepee frame. And she hung them inside that teepee frame. She took a big roast off from that seal and she tied the intestine around it. And she put it up in the center of that teepee poles let it hang over the fire. We then took the intestines over and we put two poles over a log <coughs> sticking like this. We wrapped that intestines round and round and round those poles. And we put all, put all the intestines up there. And as it dried with a sea wind and you rub an oil on it every day, you get a real nice strong rope out of that sea line, sea, uh, seal intestine. After we had all this stuff done, we went down and we got those kelp that looked like bull whips. Got that ball on the end. We take the ball in and we spin it. And we throw it and let it go and it go around the teepee. And we kept on doing it until we had it all covered. Then we took seaweed, the flat ribbon looking seaweed, about this wide, edible. And we covered all that kelp with it over top of our teepee. Now we went inside and it must have been 110 degrees in there. And we sat down and we sweated. She taught us how to sweat. And she'd take the sacred herbs and she'd put it on the fire. And then she'd tell us how the spirit of the, of the seal that we're going to eat is the food of the whale. That the two of them can't exist without the other. So when you eat the seal meat, then you become a good hunter because you, you think like the seal. And you know where the whales live and how to take care of them. By running on the beach with your spear, toughens up your legs to be able to stand in the bow of the canoe when the waves are pounding and the, all the men are paddling. Because only the young men can stand in the bow because it's, it's narrow. And the youngest of all sits down with a hoop with a seal intestine through it with a spear on the end with a harpoon. 
and you take your spears and you stop the wheel, and that kid sits there with a hoop limb and feeds the coil coming out. When it comes out, you take that seal skin that we took off, and she put seal intestines around his fins and cut them off. Same with his anus, tied it real tight, and then blew them up from the mouth like a balloon. Then we had these big seal bladders tied to their own intestine, to the harpoon head. So when we catch up to the whales, we'd stab him with our harpoons. And then the whale would keep going. We kept on stabbing him, letting more seal bladders go. When you get about eight to 10 bladders on a, on a whale, he can't dive no more. You know, and then he start, he'll drown himself. When he lets his last squirt up, all the other men dive in and we sew his mouth shut with cedar rope. So the gas inside him will build up and he'll float like a balloon. And then we start paddling and we bring him home. So the old lady taught us how to hunt, how to make the spear, how to fast, and when we were done, we ate our house. We ate it. We ate the sausage and the seaweed. The sausage and the seaweed. We didn't have to carry no water up to make it sweat in there. The dripping of the seaweed brought, created the steam inside. The seaweed being cooked up there would drip down on the hot rocks and it would steam really locked in there. And you'd sit here until we couldn't take it anymore and run down and dive in the ocean. And we'd come back and we'd sit there and sweat and we'd run and dive in the ocean. So it was back and forth. When we were done, we ate our house. When we got through eating our house, we took our poles down and the sausage was all cooked. The big thing was cooked and we ate that. So she said, get two logs about this big, which we did, about 15 feet long. We followed her back to her house and we leaned those two logs against her house. And she took all of our spears and she put them on one at a time and laced them about this far apart. It looked like a great big wide ladder going up her house. We were wondering, what is she going to do? And she took all this, the basket grass and stuff that I brought her the day before, and she hung it over her rack. So she had a real nice drying rack for her basket grass. So she got a rack, she got her sausage, she got a good sweat, she got all this nice bark off these little trees. We learned how to hunt. We learn how to make spears, we learn how to sweat, and we learn how to take care of the, the wheel. So it was a win-win situation. And that's the way the old ladies taught, that they teach us, while they're teaching us, they're getting something they want too. So teaching amongst Indian country was something that everybody, everybody gained from. It wasn't just one person gained, the whole tribe gained because all the young men now knew how to take care of the whale. He knew how to make the sausage for the elders who couldn't do it no more. He learned how to make that sacred house, which was also weapons. It wasn't just a structure to live in. You could take and pull out any portion of your frame and fight with it. A spirit, a good spirit. So we learned all kinds of things in that one little lesson with that old lady. And uh, I have pictures of her at home. And it's a marvelous, marvelous thing when you get to look at it and bring back memories of the 40s. So she also teaches how to take from the front leg of a deer. The deer all have this right here in their wrist. It's a little hook, a bone hook. And on his back, going up his back, you know, his sinew. So you take the sinew and strips off from his back and you tie it to his little front leg of that, that little hook. And you put a little huckleberry on here, you put it in the river, and you catch your fish. So this is how we used to make our fishing. How we'd catch, you know, when we're traveling around in the mountains, and we see a cricket had a lot of fish. we just go and find a deer skeleton someplace, get that hook out, pull the sinew out of him, and we put down a little stick and go fishing. So the things that the old people taught us, I mean, it was another lesson a long story that goes with that. Everything I have has long winded story. But they teach us how to make things. In nature, they show us how to gather a different medicine. This one is called kachmain. Kachmain, if you have pneumonia, and you boil this, take one clump like this and boil it, and drink it, it'll clear your lungs right up. If you have asthma, you boil it and drink it, and it'll cure you of asthma. Anything that's in bronchial, anything wrong with your lungs, 
this will heal it. If you're making a roast, and you take this and you put it on the roast for seasoning, and you cook it, it'll give your meat a good flavor. If there's something in your house that don't belong there, a ghost, a bad feeling, whatever, you take and put some of this in a shell, and you smudge it with an eagle feather, because smoke can go behind TVs and under couches, and that way you don't have to move everything out of the house. You just go along and you can smudge your house, and the smoke will go back here, and it'll sweep out all the things that's not supposed to be there. Any place you find this, you find our old people. It's their mailbox. Any place there's Kachmain, my ancestors lived there. Otherwise, the Kachmain wouldn't be there. And it's real fragile. It's one of the most fragile plants the Creator made. Its roots are six and seven feet long, and they're as big as a hair. And if you don't know how to pick it, if you go over and pick it wrong, the plant right in front of you will die. It'll die right on the spot. You break its little, its little hair, you know. So you have to be real careful when you gather Kachmain. It's one of the only things that's not on the market. You can go in a herbal store and find anything, but you can't find cockbane because they don't know what it is yet. To them, it's poison. To us, it's a strong medicine. Was there another name for it? Cockbane. It's like me. <laughs> you know, it only has one name. What does the plant look like? As soon as the botanists botanist find out what it is, they'll put a name on it. Tell what it looks the plant, like. you know what cow parsnip is? Yeah. It looks exactly like cow parsnip, except it's only this big. It's real short. Identical to cow parsnip in miniature form. The cow parsnip they use for... Uh, you take this. When I sing, a lot of times I'll sing for three and four hours straight. So when I'm singing, I'll take one, and I'll put it in the back of my mouth, and I'll gum it. It'll kind of suck the juice out of it. And it keeps your throat strong. Because we didn't have electricity when I was a child. And the old people used to make us talk so that the person between the other end of a smokehouse could hear you. And if you didn't talk loud enough, they'd take a crane feather and they'd put it down in your throat. <laughs> and it makes your throat strong so you can talk loud. So all of us would go up early in the morning. When daylight and nighttime are clashing, there's a different kind of power in the air. When daylight and night are clashing, called dawn, you go there and you pray to the water and you enter. And you bust the ice and you go inside the water. And you pray for a strong voice. So when you go under, you hold your breath. And you pray to the north. You go under and you pray to the east. You go under and you pray to the south. You go under and you pray to the west. And when you come up, then you use your voice. They say, holler and make the leaves fall off the tree. That's what we used to try to do when we were kids. So it develops your throat so that when you're talking, like we're, if I'm talking some way across it, Oh, Jim! I'll bring my voice way up without hollering. That's not a holler, that's just a, a talking. But you're using your volume. If you just bring up your talk from down here and sing from down here. I, I hate it when I go to a conference like this and I've traveled maybe a thousand miles to get there. And I get there and some guy gets up and he's reading glasses on the end of his nose. He's got a note in front of him that his secretary wrote. And he looks down and he says, my name is Jobs and Swamson. And I came here to Swamson Swamson and everybody's all going. What did he say? I said, if your secretary wrote that, she should be here. She should be here. She knows what it says. He has no business trying to read something that she wrote. If he's not talking from here, I don't listen to him. So I'm very picky and choosy to the people I go and sit down and listen to. If they're heart speakers, I love to listen to them. If they're mind speakers, I got no time because I can read what they're what they're talking about. All I have to do is go along on the tables and pick it up. And I can read it when I get home. So they taught us to do, bring our volume way up. And cockpain is one of the main things that's very very good for your for your throat. Extremely good for your throat. You're more than welcome to take one of those and put it in the back of your mouth. And uh, don't swallow the seed. Just swallow the juice. It's a it's a very healthy healthy plant. It's used in so many different ways, and like I say, it, it's a, it, it's an endangered species of plant. It, there's lots of it on the islands, but there's none on the mainland no more. So, well, my wife was saying, like, for example, back when we used to go to war, we used to 
If there was nobody else to fight, we'd fight one another. Indians love to battle. <laughs> so we, that's, if you go to my home in June, you'll see all the tribes there in the war canoes. That is what Stamish means. It means war, warriors. So they have 11 men in each canoe. They come up here to, to this place. And all the young men, because all their sisters and cousins and nieces, they can't date them. And when you come from a very close-knit family, that's all that's around you. When I was growing up, I'd say, gee, she's pretty, Mom, so that's your cousin. <laughs> God, she's really good, and that's your cousin, too. <laughs> and I, every, every girl I'd look at was my cousin. <clears throat> I don't know if that was really the truth, or they just used that to keep us. <laughs> So all the young all the young men would get in those canoes and we'd come up here to Canada to our relatives and we'd steal their good looking women. And we'd take them home and we'd marry them. And they do the same thing to us. That's why we're we're a mixture of up and down the coast. Our old people always used to go back and forth up and down the coast. So when we'd go to battle, if I if I shot him, all I did was eliminate one person if I kill him. So I used to practice my bow so I could hit what I was aiming at, and I'd shoot him in the leg really bad. I mean, I'd really penetrate him good at the bow. And it would take two people to drag him out, so I eliminated three people. <laughs> but if they'd done that to us, our medicine people showed us how to take care of that. Who all knows what a skunk cabbage is? Okay, skunk cabbage has a carrot that looks just like it, it looks just like a carrot, they're a root. If you pull up that skunk cabbage and you get that carrot and break it off and let it dry, you're holding on to pure Novocaine. So if we got shot in battle, we just push the arrow on through and shove a carrot in there. And we had no more pain. We keep right on fighting. We got shot in the stomach, we pushed on through and shoved the carrot in. So we got that Novocaine and there was no, no pain. And we could keep right on fighting. And besides, that was impressive as hell to the who was fighting. <laughs> and man, I shot that guy, he didn't even go down. But they didn't know that we were using skunk cabbage. So it was a big secret amongst our people about our, our medicines that we used. But skunk cabbage, if you, if you got a toothache, you can take, put that little piece of it on there for 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Read them say that because I told that one guy, he left it in like for three minutes. Three minutes left. <laughs> His whole mouth went dead. <laughs> you know, he's biting his tongue and everything out. <laughs> so if you put down it for 30 seconds, you know, it'll, it'll kill the toothache. If you have a, if you're walking in the woods and you fall down and you get hurt, limb stuck in your something, put that in there and it'll take care of it. If you get cut when you're out in the woods, you don't want to get dirt in there because you get infection. If you get cut at any place you look, there's a slug in the woods. Slugs are very important in the woods. If you get cut and you're out in the woods, you pick up a slug and put him on your cut. That slime makes the most beautiful band-aid you've ever seen in your life. As soon as you put it on there in 30 seconds, it's dry and it's flexible. You can move your hand and it moves with you. As soon as you get the water, you put water on it and it comes right off. But it keeps the cut clean. And it's got a, it's got a good medicine inside that slime. So you put that slug, literally a little slug trail on your cut that's good medicine. So our grandparents used to walk us through the woods and they'd show us all these different plants, how to use them, show us the slugs, show us all the different things. And we learned by walking through on a living trail is what I call it, a living trail, to walk through and see all the things on the vine. And when you can touch it, rather than just hear about it, when you can see it and touch it, then it re you really learn from it. And the Indian stories help us learn because of the humor and stuff that's in the stories. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> long time ago. Everything's always long ago. <laughs> but a long time ago, this, this, this leader of this village, he was sitting around like this, and he thought, why are we sitting around outside? I guess I'll make a real nice building. So he went out and he got all these trees that the wind blew down. And he split them really fine, the old growth trees. He made really nice wide boards. And he built this most beautiful long house you've ever seen in your life. 
He stood outside and looked at it. Man, this is the prettiest thing. Wow. So he went out in front of his buildings and, Oh, Tiam, and a shout at Tiam. Everybody can hear my voice. Come to my house tonight. Big party. Ah, everybody's just happy. <clears throat> so all the people start bringing their food, and away they come, that big potlatch. Yeah, they're all coming in prison. Here comes the little dog carrying the little dead rabbit. Wait a minute. Whoa, hold it. Hold it. Wait. Where do you think you're going? The little scumite said, you said anybody can hear you. You're welcome to my house for a party. Is this for humans only? No dogs. What? He's no dogs allowed in my house. He's, wait a minute. He's if a bear comes in the village and goes after your stupid horse, who protects it? He said, you do. He said, if we're walking out in the woods and the cougar jumps at you, who gets between you and the cougar? He said, you do. Then how come I can't come to your party? He said, this is for people only. Shoo. Boy, that dog got really mad. <laughs> really bend his nose bad. Full moon like tonight. All the dogs are out in the middle of the village howling, keeping everybody all awake because we'll teach them. They howled and howled and howled all night long. Here's the oldest dog says, that's all right. That's okay. I'll make our house. I'll fix a dog house. So the little dog, he went out in the woods and he grabbed all the limbs he could find. He drug them in. Boy, he put them together and he got through and he had this beautiful long house. Man, he was looking at his long house. This is really good. I guess I better make some benches. So now he grabbed in some more logs and he drug them in. He made real nice benches and he put them around. Boy, that dog was looking at what a fine job I had done. Now I'm going to call my friends here tonight, but you know they're always just sitting any place wagging their old tail. He said, I don't want to sit on my clean bench and get it all dirty. Ah, I'll put pigs on the wall. So he put pigs all over outside of his hut where he entered. He said, ah, see up. Everybody that can hear me. You're welcome to come to my home tonight. Jeez, all the dogs, all right, big party. Boy, they went over and dug up their little bones, got their old rabbit skins and old dead crows. Even here they come, packing their little stuff. They got to the house, and he said, before you go in, he said, take off your tails and hang it on the peg. What? He said, yeah. Why would we want to take off our tail? He said, number one, that's the only way you're going to be able to come in my house. Number two, if you leave your tail on, you'll be able to swing in your old stupid tail and get my bench all dirty. There's a fire only said, fire! Fire! Run for your life! The dog are kayaking around, beat him, and they run over one another. Over the fire they went. Run, run outside, and they grabbed just any old tail, and they put it on. <laughs> Way they went. Now to this day, if you see two dogs meet, they always smell one another. They're still looking for their tail. <laughs> I just finished. I just finished carving a totem pole. We sold it to the city of Bellingham. Yeah, and all my friends went home about 10.30 that night. And when you're carving a totem pole, that top of the pole is the last thing you do is open the eyes. And you can let your pole take a look at the new world. So however old that tree is, is how long those figures have been waiting to be born. So I was there by myself, and I said, this is my job. This I'm my pole. So I'm on top of this pole and I'm carving the eyes open on the raven. Prisoner, try to skate him. I said, I know I'm here by myself. What is that? I said, yes. Nothing. I start carving on. Try to skate him. I said, where are you? I said, I'm right here. I said, where? I looked around and I couldn't see nothing. I thought, I must ate too much red tide clams. I'm hearing things. <laughs> looked around and nothing. I start carving again. Try to skate him. I said, where are you at? So I'm right here by your right foot. I looked down and here was this really cute little frog. I thought, oh, man, what a cute little frog. He said, if you kiss me, I will turn into the most beautiful young maiden you've ever seen. I said, wow. And I put it in my pocket and I start carving. He said, try to skate him. Try to skate him. I said, what? He said, let me out of you, old fool. So I reached down and I pulled him on. I said, what's wrong with you? So I told you, if you kiss me, I'll turn into the most beautiful young maiden. As hell at my age, I have more fun of the talking frog. <laughs> you know,
our, our stories on our stories on the things that we carry. There's a lot of fun stories, and there's lots of lots of them that really have a lot of meaning behind them. Another one of the stories that that I have is a long time ago. There was a young man who had eyes for a beautiful lady. He went to her house and he asked the father, can I take your daughter out? And the father said, no, you stay away from my daughter. Why? He said, you don't have no horses. He said, you can't carve. You don't know how to hunt. He said, you're good for nothing. Stay away from my daughter. He's good for nothing. He's absolutely nothing. He said, you can't do anything. I don't want you around her. The young man went up in the mountain. He's feeling really bad. He got up in the mountain and he sat down and he pulled his scarf over his eyes and he started praying. While he was sitting up there praying, he could hear something up in a tree. And every time he'd hear that pecking in the tree, he'd hear a very pretty whistle on the wind. That must be my gift. He went over and he looked up the tree and here's his woodpecker. And the woodpecker would peck in the tree. And every time he'd peck in the tree, he'd hear a pretty whistle on the wind. The woodpecker looked down and seen him and it flew away. He thought, oh no, man, I scared away what might have been my gift. He sat there for a long time with his head hanging down. He could hear it further up the mountain. And he could hear that woodpecker pecking. He could hear a real pretty whistle on the wind. He thought, wow, maybe I can catch him this time. So he was walking up and he looked up the tree and the woodpecker seen him and it flew away again. He thought, what am I doing wrong? Here's my gift right here in front of me and I keep losing it. He thought, next time I hear it, I'm going to get on my hands and knees and I'll sneak up on him. So he could hear the woodpecker up in a tree further up the mountain. The woodpecker was pecking away in the tree and he crawled on his hands and knees. He got through the bushes and he looked up and here is this woodpecker. This woodpecker was pecking on the hollow limb of a cedar tree. The woodpecker was going after the little bugs and stuff that lived inside there. Going away and there was soft wind was blowing and a beautiful whistle was coming out the end of it. He thought, that, that must be my gift. That's got to be it. So he walked over to the tree and he asked permission of the tree to climb. He climbed up the tree and he broke off the hollow cedar limb. He got down on the ground, he put it to his arm and he broke it off again, length of his arm. He wasn't a carver, he couldn't carve, but he did the very best that he could to honor the woodpecker. And he carved the head of the woodpecker on the end of his flute. He got through carving it and he picked it up and him. Didn't work. He thought, what am I doing wrong? I took down this beautiful gift of the woodpecker, now it won't work. He was feeling really bad. So he took it and he held it to the east where the sun and the moon is born. He prayed all night. Just breaking daylight the next morning, he had a vision that the woodpecker had to be on the limb. So he carved the best he could a woodpecker and set it on the limb and it would fall off. He put it back on the limb and it would fall off. So he took a piece of knife and he cut a piece of his breech cloth off and he tied the woodpecker to the limb. He took his knife and he put it underneath the woodpecker and he broke the blade off. He took the most prized possession he owned was his trade knife. He walked over and he laid it at the foot of the cedar tree, thanking the tree for this gift that he gave to him. He took another piece of leather and he put it on his back and he went home with it. When he got home, he went to the middle of the middle of the area in front of her house. And he played for the very first time the Indian love flute, hoping that he could capture her heart. So he took his flute and he prayed to his black grandmother in the south. Fix my mouth so I can only say good words to her. He turned around and looked to, to the north to his white grandmother. Let me only hear the good things that she has to say. Don't let me listen to nothing negative. And he turned to the yellow grandmother of the east. And he said to wash away his eyes so that he can only see the beauty and good things that she has. Then he turned to the west where the red grandmother is at. And he said, this is where all things die. The sun and moon die and they go to the west. Now I'm asking you, red grandmother, to bring all four grandmothers to the center and give me the power of my, my breath, my salakwan. My breath is my salakwan. So I can play through here 
when I heard the woodpecker playing. Give me the power to win her heart. So he played for the very first time the Indian love flute. First he called upon his four grandmothers with it. The father came out, the young man took this flute and he gave it to him. <clears throat> the father was so happy to receive the first Indian love flute. He said, not only can you date my daughter, but you can have her hand in marriage. So the young man took his new bride to the mountain. When he got up in the mountain, he asked his wife, new wife, sit beneath this tree and see if you can get the echo, the palactin. Bring back the echo of the flute that I give to your father. So his new bride sat down beneath the tree and she prayed and she fasted. And she received the prayer flute. If it don't have a head on it, it's a prayer flute. When it has a head, it's a love flute. So she received in the vision, the hollow limb of the woodpecker, bear flute. And she played for the first time, the female answering of the prayer love flute. So when she come back with his flute, and if you, no matter where you travel in Indian country, you'll find the cedar flutes. Nowadays we're getting modern, we're starting to make them out of uh, different kinds of wood. Starting to use kokoboa out of Australia, uh, kaboa out of Africa, the different, different woods that give different sounds. We keep on experimenting with our flutes and see what kind of noise we can pull out of them. Every wood, like every person, has a different voice.
traveling around different places, we pick up different wood, we pick up different stories, we pick up different feelings, and no matter where we go, it seems like all cultures, all cultures are the same. When I was in Hyundai, Japan, I was talking in front of a huge art audience, and the first five rows got up and left, and that was the elders. And it really scared me because I thought, what did my interpreter say? Yeah. <laughs> because here, here's the elders walked out on me. And for the first time, I'm hardly ever caught speechless. But for the first time in my life, I was trying to become, like, what, did I, what am I going to do? So I sat there for a long time, priest, and I caught my composure, and away I went again. Now, I hope this interpreter is saying what I'm saying. About a half hour later, here come all the elders back. And they had on cedar hats, identical to ours. They had red paint on their cheeks, identical to us. And they had drums, identical to ours. And when they came back with these drums, their drums were all wrinkled up and flat. And I, they said, they asked the interpreter, can I fix them? And I told the interpreters, what's wrong with them? How'd they get like this? They said in 1941, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, the Japanese government said, quote and unquote, you're going to be the superior race. And they took all of their regalia away from them and burned it. But the people of Siandai hid theirs in the mountain. And their drums have been hidden since 1941. They said, can you fix them? Try to skate them. I said, you guys are a little bit more modern than us. At home, we use open fire. You have none here. Does anybody have a hairdryer? Uh, one lady out of about 3,000 said, yes, she had one. I said, I need your hair dryer. I need a pitcher of water. And I took my deer fat from my medicine bag, and I rubbed it on the drum, put the oil back in the skin. I poured a pitcher of water in the drum and sloshed it around and poured it back in the pitcher. And I hit it with a hair dryer. And I did this over and over and over in prison. After I got the, after I got this, got their drums back for them, I said, this, where do songs come from? And I said, out the window, I said, look out the window. And it was just like this. And I was watching, and I said, I'll sing what's on the wind to you. So I start singing. And I close, when I, when I sing, I really get into my, I love the drum. I really get into my own song. I, I do this at home all by myself almost every day. I'll sit back and play the drum, and it's, to me it's a way of relaxing. But I had my eyes closed, and I was drumming, and I could hear this weird noise. I opened my eyes, and there was over 2,000 Japanese people dancing, and their elders had their drums pounding really loud. And I wow, what a good feeling to see this. In the Mayan Lock and Dono, when I was there, they have little tiny drums about this big inside of a, a clay figure and then it has a little drum head on it. And I sang with my big drum and they'd sing with their little tiny one. The different places that we travel to, I see the different drums and different styles of song, but it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. When you're singing with a drum, when you're singing with a flute, with a guitar, or with, with what, piccolos or whatever, you're talking with your breath. You're talking with the only thing that you know how to communicate with, is the music. And, you know, when they came to Indian country, and when they introduced this to us, it was the very worst enemy they ever gave to us. Because we look at this and say, whoops, it's time to get hungry. It's time to go to bed. It's time to get up. We weren't staring much, and we actually get branded. <laughs> totally bound I don't need this. All I need is ink pen, right? Paul, that's my winter coat. <laughs> but where are these watches? And we literally live by them. I see now that it's time to quit. It's time we're done. So, before, before that, I'd like to sing a farewell song. This is a song from the from the Flakamish people. And they use it, welcome people to the reservation, 
and they use it when you're leaving the reservation. A welcoming song of the Tlacomish people and a farewell song. So I'd like to share that with you at this time. Not What I say in here is I thank you very kindly for your attention. I thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of our culture with you. It's been a very great pleasure to come here and sit on this campus where people are made very smart nowadays. <laughs> But I'm very truly happy that we could come and sit amongst you and, and, and feel like we're a part of a big family here that's happening. If there's anything that I said that offended you, I'm sorry, I'm not intended. It's a marvelous time to come and sit and talk with people. And to offend somebody is something I never want to do. But our stories and our legends I told you as they're told to me as a child. The things you've heard from me are just a little tiny bit of the creation myth, a small portion. It takes three days to tell the creation myth. And we could start early in the morning until late at night every day. We're told these stories by old people and the, the whole thing tells about how things are the way they are today. So if there's any questions from anybody, I'd be glad to answer them. 
um, Dean and Dudley have videos. On the on the videos, you'll see up in the mountain. When we're up there, you'll see it's high in the mountain. And you can see Mount Baker right through my body. And while I'm drumming, you can see eagles flying around and flying out of my drum. And the rivers and the panorama of all the old growth that we're fighting to save. The albums here, Arctic Refuge, way up, up north, they're building a pipeline going through. And the people up there depend upon the caribou for their food and their clothing. And the pipeline is going to change the, the path of that. So a whole bunch of us got together, Carlos Nakai, myself, and Sarah James, and Dean Evans, and David, the whole slug of us. That guy right there. Then this man <laughs> behind the camera is a producer of it. But we all got together and we donated songs. I've got four songs, some of them I just got through singing, our flutes. Uh, Carlos Nakai is a Cadillac of flute player beside my wife. <laughs> He's a very good flute player. But they're all on here and all proceeds go to fighting for the, to save the Arctic Refuge. So we try to do as much as we can traveling around amongst people to bring in different money for different things that we're fighting for. This whole conference is about the environment. And that's what we're here to try to protect. And I'm glad to come here and see so many people willing to take time out of their life to see if there's something they can do or add to to save the planet. Because we have to save it for our young people because they're the leaders of, of the future. And I hope and pray that all these children that are here and I've seen earlier today will be able to walk out and really look at it, not go to the library and look in the book what it used to look like. Because I see that some of the trees on the Limit Peninsula that had the title of the largest tree on Earth no longer exist them. They logged them. You see them up here on the Clay Clark Sound. They logged them for pulp. They're making pulp out of these beautiful old trees. You see the, the swamps all getting destroyed. You see all the salmon disappearing. You see the animals disappearing. So if we can step forward and do just a little bit, then that's what we have to do. If by sitting down with one another and sharing our stories and our tales, then you know that's what we should do. I see the people from Ireland carry drums like ours, the Celtics, like my wife. The Celtic people, their culture is almost identical to ours on the Coast Salish. So every place that I travel, I find all the things that my grandmother, it means Every story she told me is true. She talked about the big canoes that scattered and went all over. And they'll all meet all these people in me, and I have. In my travel, I've met all my sisters and brothers. They use the paint, they use the drum. They use all the same things that we use. Even though they have blonde hair and blue eyes, they're still sisters and brothers who still carry the old tradition. So I say cultural change, tradition shall never change. It'll always be the same. If tradition has changed in your area, there's something wrong, something terribly wrong. Sorry for the culture to change, but not your tradition. So wherever you come from, whatever walk of life you're in, make sure that you always sit down and tell your young people, while you've got them, teach them everything you can teach them. If you have parents, you're very rich. If you have grandparents, you're beyond rich. Take care of them. Love them while you got them. Oh, 